Today, we're getting into something really central in finance now, volatility-based trading. Definitely. It's a hot area. And we're looking at a specific new strategy, Volt S, based on some research material provided by a listener. Right. And what's caught our eye is how it tries to blend, you know, old school statistical analysis with machine learning. Exactly. To try and predict stock market trends by looking at how jittery stocks are, essentially, how their volatilities relate. It's a fascinating angle. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Okay, so let's dive in. What's the core process behind this Voltest strategy? The paper mentions quite a few steps. It does. It starts with data exploration, looking at correlations, autocorrelations, seeing how a stock's volatility relates to its own past or to other stocks. Stand and stuff so far. But then they bring in technical indicators, hypothesis testing. And importantly, machine learning, specifically K means plus plus clustering. They use this on the mean volatility of nine big tech names, you know, Microsoft, Google, NVIDIA, Amazon. Meta, Qualcomm, IBM, Intel, Micron, the usual suspects. Right. And they cluster them based on their average volatility levels. So you get these groups high, middle, and low volatility stocks. So it's about grouping stocks with similar nervousness profiles together, not based on price, but volatility behavior. Precisely. And this grouping helps them zero in. The really crucial step comes next, focusing on that middle volatility cluster. Okay, why the middle one? Well, we'll get into the reasoning, but they apply something called the Granger causality test specifically to stocks in that mid volatility group. Granger causality? That sounds statistical. What's the goal there? The goal is to see if the volatility pattern of one stock in that group can actually predict future volatility changes in another stock within the same group. Ah, uh, so it's not just correlation. It's looking for a predictive lead. If stock A's volatility changes before stock B's... Then potentially, stock A's volatility trend can give you signals buy, sell, or hold for stock B. That predictive link is the engine of the strategy. Interesting. Okay, let's unpack the theory a bit more. Historical volatility, or HV, seems key here. It is. Volt uses several different ways to estimate HV. The paper mentions Parkinson, Garmin Class, Roger Satchel, and Yang Zhang. Different statistical estimators for volatility. Yeah, think of them as different formulas using different bits of price data, like daily highs and lows, opening and closing prices to calculate how much the price swung around. And they have pros and cons, I assume? They do. For instance, Parkinson just uses the high and low, which is simple, but misses overnight gaps. Garmin Glass assumes prices follow a specific pattern, log normal distribution, which isn't always true. Okay. Roger Satchel is better with price ranges, but can get skewed by like really unusual price spikes, outliers. Yeah. Yang Zhang is often considered quite robust, but you know, no single estimator is perfect in all conditions. Makes sense. Now back to that focus on the mid volatility cluster. Why zoom in there? The rationale mentioned is pretty intuitive, actually. High volatility stocks might be too unpredictable, too risky. Right. And very low volatility stocks, well, they might not move enough to generate significant trading gains. So the middle ground is potentially this sweet spot. Manageable risk with enough movement for profit. That seems to be the idea, yeah. A balance. And the specific trading strategy they tested within their framework, this AITA framework, was trend following? Mostly, yes. Trend following, or TF, is a classic approach. Basically, if the predictor stock's trend suggests the target stock is heading up, you buy the target stock. Hoping the trend continues. Exactly. They use signals derived from that Granger causality analysis we talked about to trigger these TF trades. Did they look at other strategies? I mentioned mean reversion, or MR, the idea that prices tend to snap back to an average. They suggest MR could be suitable for mid-volatility assets too, but their main test focused on trend following and comparing it against a simple buy and hold. Okay, and to compare them, they use their own backtesting tool, ADBT. What kind of metrics does that look at? It covers the usual performance and risk measures, things like maximum drawdown. Which is the biggest peak to trough loss you would have experienced, right? Shows the potential downside. 
Correct. Then you have ratios like the Sharpe ratio, Sertino ratio, Kalmar ratio. These all try to quantify the return you get for the level of risk you took on. Higher is generally better. Sertino is like Sharpe, but only penalizes downside deviation, isn't it? That's right. And Kalmar relates return to the maximum drawdown. Plus, they look at straightforward profit metrics like total returns and standardized returns. Got it. So let's get into the specifics of their experiment. The nine stocks we listed using daily open high-low close data. Yes, sourced via MetaTrader 5 from TickMill. But first, an interesting step. They used anomaly detection. How so? They used a K-nearest neighbors model, a type of machine learning, to identify and actually remove periods with major market shocks. Like the COVID crash. Exactly. They specifically removed data from around March 2020. So their main analysis window became May 2020 to May 2023, arguably reflecting more normal market conditions, though normality is always debatable. Fair point. After cleaning the data, they did the volatility clustering with k-means plus plus a, you mentioned that, but they also used something called dynamic time warping, DTW. Right. DTW is interesting. It's a way to compare two time series, like volatility patterns, even if they're slightly out of sync or stretched differently over time. So it helps find similarities even if one stock's volatility pattern lags slightly behind another's? Kind of, yeah. It helps make the comparison more robust when clustering, ensuring you're grouping stocks with genuinely similar volatility shapes, even with minor time shifts. This resulted in their three clusters. And then the Granger causality test. They applied this to the mid-volatility cluster stocks, but only using data from a shorter specific window. Yes, they focused on November 2022 to May 2023 for the GCT part. Within that mid-volatility cluster during that period, they noted TSLA had the highest volatility. AMZN and Meta were kind of in the middle, and QCM and IBM were on the lower end within that mid-group. Okay, so how does the Granger test actually work? What's it calculating? Well, essentially, you take pairs of stocks from that group, say stock X and stock Y. You want to test if past values of X's volatility help predict Y's current volatility, beyond what Y's own past volatility already tells you. So does X add predictive information? Exactly. The null hypothesis is, no, X does not Granger cause Y. The alternative is, yes, it does. And how do they test that? They use statistical tests, specifically an F-test. This involves comparing prediction errors, the residual sum of squares, or RSS, from two models. One model predicts Y using only past Y values, the other predicts Y using past Y and past X values. Ah, so if adding X significantly reduces the prediction error. Then you have evidence against the null hypothesis. They use a significance level, alpha, of 0.05. If the test result is significant, they conclude that changes in stock X's volatility do seem to predict upcoming changes in stock Y's volatility, at least in the statistical sense. And they looked at different time lags, like does yesterday's volatility predict today's or does volatility from five days ago predict today's? Yes. The paper mentions they tested lags from two days up to 30 days. They found the best result, meaning the one that showed directional links between the most stocks while trying to avoid messy circular relationships, was at a lag of five days. And this gave them specific trading signals. It did. For example, they apparently found evidence suggesting you should buy Qualcomm QCLM when Meta shows a positive trend. Another signal was buying QCLM based on MU's trend, potentially a sell signal if MU was negative and buying Meta when Amazon's AMZN price increased. Okay, so these specific relationships were identified. How did the strategy perform in backtesting based on these signals? They backtested over about 40 market days, from early April to early June 2023. Started with a hypothetical $1,000 for each stock pair relationship they traded. Small scale tests. Relatively, yes. The results showed a total gain across the portfolio of $231.77, which boosted the initial $3,000, 1K per pair, seemingly three pairs, to $331.77. That's a 7.725% increase over those 40 days. After commission? Yes, they factored in a $9 commission per trade and assumed profits were compounded. They also noted positions were open on average nearly 89% of the time. What about the risk metrics for those specific trades, like AMZN predicting meta? The paper presents a table. For AMZN leading Meta, they reported 13 trades, a 61.5% win rate, a $90 return, and positive Sharp, Sortino, and Kalmar ratios. The max drawdown was around 3.8%. And Meta leading QCM. That had fewer trades, only six, but a higher win rate, 66.7%, a return of about $74, also positive risk ratios, and a slightly lower max drawdown of 2.1%. And the third one, MU leading QCM. 
Similar number of trades, 7, win rate just over 57%, return around 67%, again positive ratios, and the lowest max drawdown of the three at 1.9%. So positive returns and seemingly contained risk, at least according to these metrics for that short period. How did that compare to just buying and holding those target stocks? That's the key comparison. For Meta, when following AMZ and Signal, the strategy returned about 9%, whereas buy and hold for Meta during that exact period was closer to 7.3%. So it outperformed buy and hold there? In that instance, yes. For QCM, following Meta, the strategy returned 7.4% versus buy and hold QCM at 4.8%. Another win for the strategy. And for QCM, following MU, the strategy got 6.7% compared to buy and hold QCM at 4.8% again. So, across these specific pairs in this time frame, the Volt's trend following approach guided by Granger causality did indeed generate higher returns than simply buying and holding the target stocks. Okay, that sounds quite promising on the surface, but there must be caveats, potential downsides. Absolutely. The paper itself includes the standard crucial disclaimer, past performance does not guarantee future results. This cannot be stressed enough. Always important. What else? Well, a major one is that these Granger causality relationships, these predictive lengths based on volatility might not be stable. Market dynamics change, correlations shift, connections break down. What worked for those few months might not work next year or even next week. Regime change, basically. Exactly. Also, the Baptist period, while excluding the initial COVID shock, is still relatively short, roughly 40 trading days for the actual trading test. That's not a huge amount of time to validate a strategy. And it was only on these specific large cap U.S. tech stocks. Right. The researchers acknowledge this and mention ongoing work to test volts in completely different markets, like cryptocurrencies and DeFi tokens, which behave very differently. They also want to test it on faster time frames, like for day trading or even scalping. So more testing needed across assets and timeframes. Any other future directions mentioned? Yeah, they outlined some interesting ideas, exploring ways to bring in text information, maybe news sentiment analysis to augment the volatility signals. Combining quantitative signals with qualitative data. Potentially. Also integrating domain expert knowledge, maybe creating hybrid systems. They even talk about technical goals like exposing their AITA framework as a secure online service possibly using AI for security against bots, and building a multi-agent system with ethical considerations. Ambitious plans. Okay, so wrapping up, the Vols strategy is essentially about finding stocks whose volatility patterns seem to predict others, specifically within a mid-volatility group. Using Granger causality to identify those predictive links. And then using those links to drive a trend-following trading strategy. And the initial limited bag testing showed it could outperform buy and hold for the tested pairs and period. But with the very strong caveat that this needs much more validation and the underlying relationships might not last. Precisely. It's an innovative approach, focusing on these second-order relationships in volatility. But like any strategy, it carries inherent risks and uncertainties. So a final thought maybe for you listening. This idea of looking for predictive power in how volatile assets are relative to each other. How might that change your perspective on market dynamics, even if those links are temporary? And beyond volatility, what other perhaps overlooked data relationships might hold clues about where markets are headed next? Something to think about. 